Hello and Rory, welcome to another episode of Be My Guest. Now, today is one of those days when it really hits home to me why I started this podcast in the first place, and it was to meet people like Katie. Now, Katie was born into a commune in South London, and she lived there for 30 years. I said the word lived, but survived is probably a better word, to be honest with you. When I first came across Katie's story, I had so many questions in my head. What were the conditions like there? Who were her parents? Because she didn't know that. How did she escape? Did she ever seek revenge? And what ever happened to the leader of that commune? There were so many unanswered questions. And today, I got the answers. So Katie, I suppose by understanding the house and the household that you were brought up in is the best place to start. And the head of the cult was known as Comrade Bala, whose real name was Aravindan Balakrishnan. Uh, He was also referred to as A.B. And he lived with you and six people. You were called Comrades. They were called Josie, Shan, Aisha, Leanne, Cindy and O. Ebby's wife, comrade Shanda, and her sister Shobna also shared the house, but you didn't see much of them. So at a young age, when you were growing up with all of these people in the house, what were you told about these people at a young age? Who were they? Um, they were the comrades. Um, I didn't didn't know anything more than that. They were just they were just the comrades, and we we had to we all had to do as we were told, basically. Mm-hmm. To, uh, by A B. By A B, and well, I always felt like I was bottom of the pile because I had to listen to everybody else as well. Were you the youngest? Um, I was the youngest. I was the mm-hmm. only child. Were, were, were you told at that uh, young age that they were family? No. I didn't quite know what it was going on, really, but I was told that we were like a a communist party in exile and that we had to keep very quiet and never speak to anyone outside the house about what was actually going on inside the house Mm -hmm. and as time went on we were even told that we shouldn't speak out loud about things because I was told that the British fascist state were listening into everything we were talking about so I was told that we mustn't talk things out loud so that we had to write things down (laughs) right right so at that young age if you were told that all of these people in the house were comrades. They, mm. at this stage, they weren't family. So uh, who were you told were your parents? I wasn't I wasn't told anything like that. And l- later on, as time went on, when I started to read things that I was not meant to read, and, and a lot of questions came up, and I kind of didn't know what exactly was going on. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know. I didn't know who my parents were till much later. What were you told about your birth? I remember being told that I jumped onto Comrade Bala's hand, as if I was from the clouds or from the sky. And then later on, I was told that if anyone else asked how I was born or whatever, that I was to say that I was a foundling that they had found and. Mm-hmm brought home and I wasn't sure which one was the real one but as time went on I, I realized I can't jump from the sky so I thought probably I was a foundling mm. and I guess as a child you and don't then, question these things you just believe what adults are telling you for the most part but <laughs> I was quite a what do you call shall we say I don't know if the word precocious is right but I was the sort of child who always asked questions mm-hmm. which got me into a lot of trouble <laughs> but I I didn't always accept what I was told. What 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 type of cult was it? What was AB's beliefs? 
<clears throat> that was that, that was really kind of strange because before this is what I was told before I was born it was a a Maoist like a, a Maoist group a very extreme left-wing radical group and as time went on it became pseudo-religious and when I grew up I was told that AB was not only the leader of the world in exile but also some form of god and that he had a mind control machine who could read all our thoughts and could create natural disasters in the world what was that machine called it was called jackie jackie uh, but even the name of jackie kind of evolved over time mm-hmm. why was it called it used jackie to be called different things it stood for Jehovah, Allah, Christ, Krishna, and Immortal Iswaran, which is basically the gods of all the major religions. And the the nature of your upbringing was dubbed Project Prem. What does that mean? That's right. It was meant to be a a kind of blueprint for how children would grow up <clears throat> when AB was the ruler of the world. And it was it was done on you because you were the youngest. So what was the difference in age between the person who was next older than you? Um, 27 years. 27 years. Yeah. And what were you, what were you told? So uh, just so I can get an understanding, if they weren't family members but they were comrades, were they mm. at this stage as a child, did you know, did you have an understanding... Were they related to A.B. and his wife in any way? I didn't think so. I I didn't know. It was just like we were a commune, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's the best thing you could say. But we were called the collective. We used to... Well, I, I don't say we called ourselves because I didn't have a say in the matter. A.B. used to say we were called the communist collective. But as time went on, I used to call it the cult. So what what were the conditions like? Because... From the outside of the house, did it look like a typical house in South London? Uh, yes, I suppose it did. I, I don't know. I didn't really go out as a child. And also we moved house a lot. Mm-hmm. We kind of stayed in a place for maximum three years for most of the time when I was a child. And then we would either move or we would get evicted because we didn't pay the rent. And you said earlier you weren't allowed to leave the house so how often would you have left the house? Sometimes there would be a whole year would go by and I wouldn't go out at all. It was only only when a family member visited that I was allowed to go out. And the reason was because they didn't want me to be seen by their family members. Did you have windows in the house? Because I was the secret child. Yes, there were windows in the house, but I was strictly told never to look out of them and the reason for that was I was told that fascist state agents will be keeping an eye and wanting to take me away but as time went on I realized that that was not the real reason it Mm. was because they didn't want me to see the fun that people outside were having Mm. because other people seem to have a much nicer environment than where I was growing up in Mm. and I just did, did, did you have realized that they didn't want that? Yeah. Did you have access to seeing through the windows, or were there curtains, blinds? Were they boarded up, or could you see the outside world? Um, there were curtains generally, but I, there were always there at all times. There was someone in the room with me, so I couldn't do what I wanted. If I wanted to go to the window and look out, someone would be there to tell me not to do that and if I didn't listen then it would have been reported to AB and then I would have got into trouble so but there were a few occasions when I managed to sneak peeks out of the window so and if anybody found out it was always I always got into serious trouble for that but Mm. yes you said there that that would get you into trouble what did trouble with AB mean I used to get beaten black and blue and banished, which meant that no one would speak to me or sort of acknowledge my 
existence if I had broken a rule mm -hmm. that was made by the cult. Mm -hmm. Were there a lot of rules? There were a lot of rules. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them didn't make any sense. And sometimes they changed as well, which was very hard to keep up with because sometimes something was all right and sometimes it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I think really what was going on was there were a lot of rules. Sometimes they were not so strictly enforced. So you thought you could get away with something. And maybe if the other cult members were in a good mood, something was overlooked. But if they were in a bad mood, then the rules were enforced very severely. And, and then something which you thought was all right was suddenly not all right. Mm. And that was so hard to keep up with. You never knew when you were going to fall into this almighty fire pit and <laughs> it made life so stressful and ridden with anxiety really because you never knew what was happening next I mean there was no security there was no stability of any sort mm -hmm. what were some of the rules that didn't make sense um well like not looking out of the window or that you can't go out or you can't talk to anyone outside the house it just didn't make sense. Or that two people had to go out together when they went shopping. No one was allowed to go out on their own. And and then the explanations for these rules often didn't make sense as well. Because it was like, for example, we were told that people had to go in pairs because it wasn't safe to go on their own. But... Some people went on their own all right. Like there were a couple of cult members who used to go to work mm -hmm. and they managed to go on their own and there was no reason why they couldn't go on their own. Yeah. And, and with some of the comrades being allowed to go to work, were you allowed to go to school? Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't allowed to go to school. And I was always told that this was great because some of the other cult members had been bullied as children and bullied in school and school was quite unpleasant for them. Mm -hmm. So I was told I was escaping all that unpleasantness. Were, were you homeschooled? I was, well, I wouldn't say I was properly homeschooled. I was taught to read and write and to do basic maths. By who? But I taught myself by the cult members. I can't remember who particularly, but I do remember Aisha teaching me maths and I do remember Josie teaching me to write, I think, and probably Sean as well. If you were ill, were you allowed to go to a GP, a doctor? If you had a toothache, no. were you allowed to go to a dentist? No, nothing like that was allowed at all. I was told that I wasn't following AB's guidelines strictly enough, and that's why I was ill. So I needed to get punished for being ill. And I often used to get beaten black and blue for being ill. So I learned to hide when I was ill and pretend that I was not ill when I was ill. But sometimes you couldn't hide it because like, if you've got a horrific cold, you're not likely to, to be able to hide that. Mm -hmm. And I just never, never seemed to get well. Also, because I never went out and windows were not open. There was no fresh air. There were so many people in a small space. And I never used to get well. I used to get like, relapses of colds over and over and over and I was always a very sickly child well because yes. because you're not allowed out because you're not going to school not assume you had no friends what was your no. daily routine in the house I remember we used to have to get up at a specific time like eight o'clock and it used to have to be bang on time everything was right on the dot there was no leeway a few minutes here a few minutes there it was all bang on time and then we used to have to sit around and or stand around as some of the other members used to do and listen to a long windy lecture from ab about how he's the ruler of the universe and how everything's related to him and how bad everybody in the cult is that they don't realize how great he is and they don't work with him properly and then we used to have to sing songs in praise of him and then I used to have to write write down things that had been dictated out by him like he would dictate something to Sean 
and she would write it down and then we all had to copy that or work on something else ourselves based on what he had talked about about like a list of how all the events going on in the world were directly related to events going on in the collective like for example uh, when the landlord uh, demanded rent there was an earthquake in Los Angeles or whatever so that was the punishment for the fascist state by Jackie because AB and the collective had been impinged upon by the landlord's demand for rent. So the, your, your day-to-day life, even hour by hour, minute by minute, was controlled by AB? Absolutely. And then I used to have to have a nap in the afternoon and that was so difficult for me because... I had boundless energy and I wasn't allowed to go out. Mm-hmm. So so I found it really difficult to have a nap in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And then I used to get beaten up for not being able to have a nap in the afternoon. Gosh. What do you remember from after the violence? What was going through your mind as a child? No, I, I don't know. I just was hoping and praying it didn't get worse and that it will end somewhere. Mm-hmm. And usually the aftermath of the violence was in some ways worse than the violence itself because it was like a an emotional and psychological violence where everybody would withdraw from you and they would treat you like you were not human. You couldn't talk to anybody. They wouldn't acknowledge you. And and it was it was not just humiliating, it was extremely unpleasant and it meant that you couldn't really make friends with anybody was there any time no. for fun well, fun was not fun was banned fun was not allowed that was the that was the decadent bourgeois lifestyle that communists like us were not allowed to partake in so laughing even was banned i remember i used to get disciplined for laughing when i was a child and told that I was being very badly behaved if I if I found something funny. Mm. So uh, d- describe you to get into endless trouble. <laughs> Bless you. D- describe for me, uh, if you can, build a picture for me of the house inside. I would say it looked like a typical house. I mean, there would be a corridor, a hallway, and a living room and things like that. But usually the living room turned into A.B. and his wife's bedroom. So that was... There wasn't like a a lounge, you know, where people sat around and watched TV. That was his, that was his room. Mm-hmm. And then... I mean, there was a kitchen and bathroom, and were you were you allowed to watch TV? Um, I, I was, but it was it was strictly controlled what I was allowed to watch. I was as time went on. Sometimes I was allowed to watch nature programs, and then when I was around nineteen or twenty, I was told that I had to watch the six o'clock news every day. Well, everybody had to watch it mm-hmm. and listen to the rants of of AB about how everything is bad in the world outside and how everything will only be solved when he became ruler of the universe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Did you, at this time, wonder who your parents were? Well, I had been wondering for a long time. AB used to talk about his parents and I used to wonder, who are my parents? Mm -hmm. And then when I was, I think I was... 12 years old we had issues about housing because the council kept sending us to places which were unsuitable because there was a Shobna was disabled and we had certain requirements because she was disabled so the the houses that the council provided sometimes were not fit for purpose and there was there was worry that we may end up without without a roof over our head so at that point, A.B. said to Sean that she could 
if things if the in the worst case scenario we could go she could take me to go and live with her mother and at that point he showed me a, a piece of it was a pink card from the hospital which said that Sean was my mother and but he said she wasn't actually your mother she just claimed you that's what he said and on that card, it didn't say a father's name, did it? No. No. So take me back then, because there was a huge turning point in your life when you were 13 years old, and it was December 1996. And I know this yes. can't be easy for you to go over these details, so only tell me what you feel comfortable in telling me. But what happened in December '96? Um, well, Sean started to behave in a very odd way. She was, I mean, she was always odd, let's say, but she was always together as well. But she started to behave more odd than usual, if that was possible, and to imagine that things were there that were not there, and imagine that strangers on the street were being funny with her, and that they had... had lasers in their eyes and she started talking to people who were not there in the house so and saying things like I'm the devil I should be killed and I don't want to eat and all sorts of weird stuff and I know and I knew that um her father had killed himself when she was 17 and I thought this sounds this is weird. And I said, I think she needs to, she needs some help, you know, mm -hmm. she needs to get psychological help. And AB just dismissed it and said, oh no, she's all right. She just needs to focus on me. She's not focusing on me properly. That's why this is happening. And then on a, a, a number of occasions in the middle of the night, I woke up to sounds of screaming and shouting. And I later heard that Shana tried to stab herself with a knife and that she had tried to run out of the house. And I, I went downstairs after all this screaming had begun and found her tied up and gagged because she was saying she wanted to leave the house and go back to her to see her mother. And this was just so unusual because Shan was an absolute devotee of the of A.B. and the cult and there was no way that she would ever challenge him. Mm-hmm. Even if he was beating her black and blue, she would never challenge him. And suddenly she did. And this was so odd. And then the day after, she threw herself from the second floor window and ended up paralysed from the neck down. Gosh. And then she was in hospital for for eight months and before she died. Mm -hmm. Did you visit her in hospital? I did, yes, and on one occasion I I knew I shouldn't have said this. I was not allowed to say this, but I somehow knew that I wouldn't see her again, so I said bye-bye mummy to her. Mm -hmm. And she said bye-bye baby to me, and that was at that moment I thought, she is my mother, mm. I, because that look that passed between us, it was the first time ever she looked at me with something approaching love. Previous to that, it was like she was trying to deny that love that she felt because she knew that went against the rules of the cult to show love to her own daughter and that that would be seen as as going against AB. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, she couldn't, she couldn't help it and it happened. And that was the last time I ever saw her. And then after she died, AB blamed me for that, saying that because... You did that, she was punished and she died. Gosh. What impact did her death have on the cult? Well, it, it was it was different. There was for me personally, I didn't know she was my mum up until then, and she had always been the worst bully in my life. So not having her around was quite a relief, honestly, because she used to breathe down my neck all the time. And she was always reporting me and getting me into trouble. 
because I think she was trying to deny her own motherly love. So she was trying to prove that she was the worst, mm -hmm. that she was the strictest and that she would never, ever yield to her maternal instinct. Otherwise, she would go down in the packing order. So for me, it was a relief that she was no longer there. I mean, when she was in hospital, I felt really relieved because I felt free for the first time, even though mm. there was, it wasn't free. I wasn't allowed to go out. But in the house, the worst um, disciplinarian had gone. There was an element of freedom for me. It, it meant as well that because you're of a certain age now, you're beginning to question things. And it was around this time that there was a bit more doubt about the cult and about AB, wasn't there for you? Well, yes. The The main thing that happened was I was able to have a lot more access to, to things that I was not meant to read because she was not breathing down my neck. Mm -hmm. And the more I read, the more I realised something is really not quite right here. So the only thing that you can do, which seems very out of the ordinary at that time, and something that, you know, you can only dream of, is escaping. How did you plan your escape? Yes. Well, when I was that age, I had no idea what to do because everybody was around all the time. And even though I may have had a chance to read... A bit more there was always somebody like manning the front door or the back door there was no way I could have got out of the house and besides I didn't know anybody outside either in order mm -hmm. to get to get out I remember when a few years later when there was some scaffolding put up on the neighbor's house I remember thinking oh if only I could get out onto that scaffolding from the window and run through the house but it was it was pie in the sky, really. There was no way that I could actually get out. It was just so well protected. And everybody was always looking out the window and checking. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't have got a few yards before they got me back. So I guess the, the best thing to do is to get an ally. Well, again, it was a long process, as is everything in this situation. Mm -hmm. This and, and this was 17 years after my mum threw herself from the window. Chanda was bullying Josie and Josie was feeling very unhappy about it because basically she had devoted her life to this cult and she couldn't take it that she was being bullied all the time and lied about. She used to get lied about and she used to find that really hard, as anyone would. But And then she used to um, talk to me. So I, after a while, I comforted her and then after a while I said to her, but that's what you used to do to me. When I was a child, you used to always report me and when I was growing up. And Josie felt bad about that and she realised, yes, that is exactly what I used to do and now I don't like it when I'm on the receiving end of it. So that created a kind of, I don't know, a bond between mm. us. And how did you and Josie come up with the plan to escape? We were trying to think what we could do and I suggested that we, we buy mobile phones because the landline in the house was paid for by AB and Chanda and they would know who who was being contacted by that phone mm -hmm. so we didn't want we didn't want a charity number or refuge number coming up on the on the list so we said we have to find a way of getting a method of communication and going to the phone box was not good enough because you couldn't really, they couldn't really ring back. Mm -hmm. So, so we smuggled mobile phones into the house. Well, I didn't do it, but I asked her to do it and she did. <clears throat> and then about a week or two before I finally managed to escape, a number came up on the TV during the six o'clock news about forced marriages. And they said, if, if at the end of the item, they said, if anybody has concerns along these lines, 
this is the number that you could call. And we both, both myself and Josie, memorized that number. Mm-hmm. And then the next day when A.B. and Chanda went out sh- shopping, we called it. And, and then, well, we arranged for someone to come. Mm-hmm. On the day when they were, we knew they would both be out at a specific time. Why did you choose um, to call that number and not the police? Well, I didn't want. I was worried because AB was very good at talking everybody round, and I was worried if the police came to the door, he would turn them away, and then. They would he would know that someone had called mm-hmm. and then that I would be killed or whatever. So it had to be done in a very sneaky way mm-hmm. that they didn't find out. And also I had a lot of writing that I wanted to take with me. So I didn't want to just run away. I needed to have a I needed someone to help me to bring all my stuff out. Mm-hmm. Well. Uh, that day was so, October but, the twenty fifth, twenty thirteen. Tell me about that day. What right. happened? On that day, um, AB and Chanda went shopping as usual at eleven o'clock. They were they always did everything did everything bang on time. So in a way, that was very good for us because we knew when they would be away and when someone could come to pick us up. So Josie and I left the house with our trolleys full of my stuff and her stuff, and we met them around the corner the, the the people from the charity and where were you taken and yeah and that's it we were well we were yeah we were taken to Leeds mm-hmm. to a safe house yes mm-hmm. what do you remember about that journey because you're in a car you're seeing well outside of your house outside of London for the first time what do you remember from that journey um well, it was it was at night, mm-hmm. but I remember not being able to believe that this was real, that I was finally out of that place and that I had all my things safe with me and that I was I was free. It was not it was like no, I I can't couldn't really believe it. But I also felt quite ill at the time because I found out later on I had undiagnosed diabetes, so I was not feeling the best of health. Mm-hmm. So after that, it was around a month after your escape that A.B. was then arrested and the process to start to bring him to justice began. Um, That's right. And it was during this process, wasn't it, that you found out who your real father was? How did that come around? Um, We did a DNA test. And it was proven that he was my father. A.B. Yes. Mm-hmm. How did that make you feel? Well, I was glad to know it, for sure, because I'd always suspected it. So it was, yeah, I was glad to find out for sure who my parents were. Mm-hmm. Did you also find out that Chan was your mother or are you still not 100% certain? Oh, I I know. I knew that a while back because I managed to tease it out of Aisha because she always tried to dodge the issue, but she admitted that Sean was pregnant mm-hmm. and that that I was her daughter. So, so it was it was as much confirmation as you needed. Yeah. Yeah. So in December 2015, uh, Bala was convicted of six counts of indecent assault, four counts of rape, two counts of actual bodily harm. He was also found guilty of cruelty to a child under 16. It was found that he used violence, fear and sexual humiliation to control women that he held captive. He raped two followers, falsely imprisoned and mistreated his daughter, which was you, for more than 30 years in a commune in South London. He was later sentenced to 23 years in prison. Were you there in person for the sentencing? Well, I I went to court to give evidence, but I wasn't there in person for the sentencing, no. Mm -hmm. Did you 
later read the judge's remarks when the judge was mentioned in you? Yes, I yeah. did, but I can't remember exactly what they said. But. Yeah, well, uh, I've got it here, so it won't be, you know, it won't be the first time that you're hearing this. But the judge said uh, to A.B., your daughter was an experiment, deprived of love and affection. You lied to her that she was an orphan. You never formally acknowledged that she was your daughter until the trial. Your treatment of her from her birth to adulthood was a catalogue of mental and physical abuse. You decided to treat her as a project, not a person. Mm. How did it feel to have that recognised in court? Yes, I, I yes, I felt validated. It was a wonderful feeling. But at the same time, I was I'm not a, a great believer in punishment. So I because I'd been punished so much growing up, I kind of don't like that kind of thing. And I it felt a bit like revenge as well. So I thought, no, I didn't want him to spend 23 years in prison. All I wanted was it to be acknowledged that what happened was wrong. Mhm. So would you have been comfortable for him not to go to prison? Yes, I mean, I'd forgiven him by that point. So mm -hmm. it was like, no, I I don't really believe in prison. I'm, mm -hmm. I think it's a quite, it's an archaic, it's a relic of a medieval time. I don't think we, I think there are better ways to to deal with issues than to cage people out. Mm -hmm. What, so that is another that's a matter for another time. What what would have been a better way? Well I don't know. I don't I some of these things you don't I don't really know, but I, I mean if someone is very dangerous and cannot help themselves, then I can understand keeping them in a cage. But I think by that point I don't think my dad would have done any any more harm at that point did you forgive him in person i mean i no, i never managed to meet up with him to say that i wish mm -hmm. i had i i always thought that he had time left but mm -hmm. i really i found out in 2022 that he passed away so i was quite i was quite upset about that really because it meant that i didn't there wasn't the chance for a for a reconciliation, if that was ever to happen. I don't know if he was ever able to think or even to consider that he may have done something wrong. But I I just, th when you think about it, I don't think, sometimes I don't think he meant to be bad. I think he just, his ideas were just so at variance with reality. I mean, he really believed that the the world was dangerous and that he was keeping me safe, so it was a, it was an ideology which he couldn't break free from. Was it was it difficult to forgive him? Well, when I was in the cult, I I found it very difficult to sort of be kind towards them, because. Because I was stuck there and I didn't know how to get out. But once I was free, yes, I found it quite easy to forgive, really, because it was like everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has their own reasons for what they do. And even that, even if we can't understand it, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person. Did you feel you had to forgive in order to move on? Um. In a way, yes. I mean, it was, I felt that 30 years of my life had already been stolen and I didn't want to waste any more time holding on to anger and hatred. Because, I mean, like Nelson Mandela said when he left prison, that if he didn't give up bitterness and hatred, that he would not really have been free. And that, that made a great impact on me. And I kind of thought, yes. If you hold on to anger and hatred, you're not free. They still live rent-free in your head. It's not easy to get to that place. And there's a lot of people listening that would forgive you for feeling angry and holding that resentment in your heart. Mm. How difficult was it to give that up? 
I, I didn't find it that difficult, really, because I, I think it's a weakness. It's indulgence. If you're holding on to anger and hatred, it's like any other addiction. I don't really want to be addicted to hate. That is, to me, is the most poisonous form of addiction. And I can understand that people who are struggling will may seek refuge in addiction, but that is not helping. That is only harming them further, and it's actually not harming the person that they hate. It's only harming them. So you don't hate A.B.? No. Do you love him? Um, well, I think I want to say I'd love the idea of what he could have been if he wasn't taken over by this toxic ideology. But mm. I don't love what he did, obviously. That was... And I also, I suppose I grieve the father he could have been if he had chosen not to follow the toxic ideology. Mm-hmm. And also, I think he needed mental health support. That's another thing. Because he was clearly very mentally ill and he didn't get the support that he needed. So that's why the, these things happened. Did you ever have an opportunity to visit him in prison? Um, not really. I suppose I could have if I wanted to, but I, I just didn't know where to begin. And mm. I didn't know what to say. And I, 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 I believe that the prisoner had to ask first, and I don't think he ever would have done. So mm. I was mm. hoping that there would that a time would come, but it never did. Mm-hmm. So it's coming up to two years since his death now how mm. how's life for you now no oh, life is a lot better i i'm addicted to traveling that <laughs> is an addiction and i think that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> so i'm always traveling i look after animals do you work yes i mean i that's my job at the moment looking after pets and do you have a yeah. good network around you do you have friends yes i do yes mm-hmm. but i but i have to be honest i love animals i love dogs more than <laughs> do you, the world. what you said there about traveling that you're addicted to traveling yeah um yeah I, I guess this must be because you had such lack of freedom up until you were 30 years old yeah mm-hmm. yes i yeah i feel like i've missed out so much and every minute is precious now so I want to spend it doing the things that I enjoy doing. How much do you enjoy that freedom? Because you, you must enjoy it and appreciate it more than most because you know what it's like not to have that freedom. Yes, that's very true. I do. I, I relish it. It's an absolute delight. Go where I want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think the first 30 years of your life has taught you about the way you live your life today? Um, I think, I suppose what I could say is that nothing is guaranteed. You have to enjoy every minute because you never know what will happen next. So, and I feel that a lot of people, well, myself included at times, focus on the negative a lot and what is not right and what could be better but we don't we are not grateful for what is right and I think if we focus on what is is good we would be a lot happier 